Welcome to the Health Workforce Tactical Assistance Center's webinar series. This webinar was co-sponsored by Academy Health's Health Workforce Interest Group, and it was entitled Enabling Dental Therapy Practice to Improve Access to Oral Health Services. And it was presented by Sermona Sardu, Margaret Langelier, and Beth Burks on February 9th, 2022. Now, with that said, I'd like to go ahead and introduce to you today's moderator. Janet Kaufman is the chair of Academy Health's Health Workforce Interest Group, and she's also a professor of health policy at the University of California, San Francisco. Janet, would you like to tell us a little bit about the IG and introduce today's speakers? Absolutely. Thank you very much, David. So um, the Academy Health Workforce Interest Group uh, is, is one of a number of interest groups that are part of the Academy Health Organization. Our mission is to improve health and healthcare by promoting research and disseminating evidence that informs health workforce policy and practice. Um, and if, so if you are an Academy Health member, um, please consider joining our interest group. Uh, we will have a 90 minute meeting at the next Academy Health annual research meeting in June. And we also um, sponsor a few events throughout the year, including this webinar. And we're just so delighted to be able to partner with the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center um, to present this webinar and make it available not only to Academy Health members, but other uh, folks who are interested in health workforce policy. And I'm especially delighted that we have this webinar on dental therapy, which is a, I think a very innovative, important model for improving access to oral health care, and also a model that gives us some uh, lessons to learn uh, about the challenges of standing up a new profession that are applicable uh, across the health spectrum, not just in oral health. I'm going to now briefly introduce our, our panelists. Uh, unfortunately, um, Aubrey Kotek will not be able to join us today. Um, but we instead are joined by Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Mertz, um, who um, has worked very uh, closely with Ms. Kotek and with our other presenters. And so all three presenters, Dr. Elizabeth Mertz will speak first, and then Dr. Simona Surdu and uh, Ms. Marty Langlier are all principal investigators with the Oral Health Workforce Research Center. Um, the center is based at University of Albany, but Dr. Mertz, who's at UCSF and Ms. Kotek, collaborate with them. Uh, and this is one of several, her, uh, more than several, a uh, number of health workforce research centers that the Health Resources and Services Administration has funded across the country. This is the one center really focused on oral health. And as you'll hear from our speakers, all three have done a, a lot of uh, research on uh, dental therapy. Uh, and I think I have a lot of uh, great uh, information to share with you today. Uh, so without further ado, um, Beth, if you um, could lead us off. Happy to do so. Thank you, Janet. Let me just get my screen going. All right. Um, so I have been asked to just do an introduction um, to what dental therapy is for those of you who may not be familiar with this new uh, profession that has been developing over the last decade. Um, so I'm just going to uh, walk through oh, this. Uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to just walk through the context and rationale for um, expanding the oral health workforce in the U.S. Um, some definitions of dental therapy and how they fit within the broader dental team. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the origins and evolution of dental therapy and then some current, the current status or of, of the authorization and implementation of dental therapy across um, states and tribes. So a couple of key contextual points. Um, the 2000 uh, US Surgeon General's report really highlighted um, the gaps in access to care. Um, about 30% of the U.S. population has difficulty accessing care, and um, one of the main uh, focuses of their call to action was to increase workforce diversity, capacity, and flexibility. Um, in 2011, there were a couple of IOM reports that reiterated most of the concerns of the 2000 reports and didn't show much progress. 
in terms of, uh, of improving access to care and um, getting more uh, distributed dental services, particularly to underserved populations. Um, and then in 2021, uh, the National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research just um, released the follow-up to the Surgeon General's report. Um, and again, many of the same issues there, um, looking at uh, you know, lots of dental graduates, but they have very high debt. Um, there's lack of workforce racial ethnic diversity um, and, uh, and sort of a, a shift in paradigm of thinking more about bringing care to communities instead of just um, focusing on uh, the whole model versus just the individuals. Um, for in terms of specific to uh, dental therapy or any of the, the, I'll show you a few different new models, um, but there are some, some, as you know, going to be a dentist is you've got to go through four years of undergrad and then four years of graduate school and then often additional training after that. So um, really expanding the career ladder and providing economic development um, for communities um, at, a, at a different level than postgraduate. Um, also to improve care coordination and to access culturally competent and respectful care. Um, there's a, the dental profession itself is not very diverse um, and uh, for, for reasons that I've just noted and um, uh, really being able to look at the whole team and Im improve diversity across the team um, to, to help address those issues. So the traditional probably, uh, these three are probably what you think of as, as the dental team. You've got the dentist, the dental hygienist, and the dental assistant. Sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Those here. Um, we have dental lab techs. They're sort of in decline. Um, a lot of that work is now outsourced. Um, so community dental health coordinators were developed um, to do uh, care coordination in communities. However, there is not much at this point uh, direct reimbursement for this work. And then within dental hygiene and dental assisting, there's been a lot of work and expanded function for these providers, um, similar to, to what we see in a lot of the other professions, uh, where uh, you know expanded scope of practice, ability to work with direct access, things like that. So the dental therapists are really over here, are very, uh, very different um, than any of the existing providers. Um, so, and then they're in, the, the difference is that they, they can do the preventive work, but they can also do the um, restorative work, um, some basic restorative work that previously had only been um, allowed uh, if, if you had a dental license, um, so that they can be considered sort of a primary care dental provider, um, similar to uh, um, a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner, if you, in terms of um, kind of, you know, has some of the scope of the other providers, but, but some not. And then it's it, the way that the implementation has played out is that we have actually three different sort of models of dental therapy. So there's the dental health aid therapist, which is used in um, Alaska in the community health aid program, uh, dental therapist, and advanced dental therapist. And I'll talk a little bit more about why why these three models. They're they're very similar, small differences between, but they're they're sort of different um, reasons for why they've evolved that way. Um, as I said, they're primary oral health care providers and dental therapists are new to the United States, but they've been used for over a century or almost a century in over 50 different countries. Um, and they work as part of the dental care team, um, providing clinical and therapeutic care, including prevention, routine restorative care, um, such as filling cavities, placing temporary crowns and extracting teeth. Um, and the global use of dental therapists and their safety and effectiveness has really been demonstrated in various health systems and settings. So what drove dental therapy adoption here in the US? Um, well, these big gaps in access to care and community engagement around how do we as a community come together and find solutions um, to fill this gap? Um, uh, the work really actually did start in uh, tribal communities in Alaska. Um, and it was really rooted in tribal self-determination as well as community health advocacy and a focus on trying to improve equity. Uh, this was then paired with very strong champions uh, of uh, decades long sustained philanthropic investment um, and support from uh, many other partners. Um, and, and then the documented need to improve access to care uh, as well as to build a more representative and accessible uh, workforce. I'll just go over the timeline here. In 2005, uh, the dental health aid therapist was authorized, um, uh, or dental health aid therapist started um, 
uh, practicing in Alaska. Um, they were authorized in 2002, as I said, through the community health aid program. And the first two cohorts of dental therapists were actually trained in New Zealand um, and then went back to work in the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Separate from that effort, um, but somewhat informed by it, uh, and Minnesota was the first state to pass legislation. The CHAP program is a, is a tribal sovereign pro program that serves tribal um, uh, within the tribal sovereign areas. Um, and Minnesota um, created two levels of dental therapists. So they have a dental therapist and an advanced dental therapist. That's why you see those three different um, um, categories of providers. Um, and the primary difference there is the ability to work independently, although there is, I think, a little few small things of um, scope. And by independently, I mean um, not as an independent practitioner, but um, under general supervision, so they don't need to have the dentist on site. 2014, Maine authorized dental therapy. And then in 2015, this was a big change. The uh, CODA, which is the Commission on Dental Accreditation, approved standards for dental therapy programs, which really sort of set the stage for the development of, of future educational programs um, with, oops, sorry, with uh, uh, some standardization there. 2016, we got Vermont. Um, DHAT started practicing in Washington um, and in Oregon under um, uh, either specific laws or, or pilot practice uh, or pilot projects. Um, 2018, we had a few more states, Arizona, Michigan, um, and then 2019, a bunch more states, Connecticut, Idaho, Montana, Vermont, New Mexico. Um, in 2020, a second pilot project was approved in Oregon, um, and um, the dental therapy education program in, at Ilsavik College, which is Alaska's only tribal college, was the first uh, education program to gain full Code of accreditation. So that was quite a milestone. Um, and then 2021, five at oops, sorry, at 20, sorry, I'm having problems with my in 2021, we have five states that have dental therapists actually in practice, actually on the ground in practice. Um, so this lays out the different states. I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, there, I just to point out, there are variations in the type of authorization. So whether it's authorized through a tribal mechanism, a state mechanism, or a pilot project, um, I will say now that those Oregon pilot projects are authorized under state legislation. So that is has moved from a pilot to a fully authorized um, state. Um, whether or not the state requires quota accreditation, Remember, that didn't happen until 2015. So Alaska, Minnesota, Maine, and Washington um, uh, uh, put their regulations in place prior to CODA existing, and only Maine so far has actually gone back and changed uh, that to require CODA. Dental hygiene prerequisite, this is something, um, again, there's a lot of overlap with dental hygiene, um, and so uh, having uh, a prerequisite for this has been a choice that some states have um, um, selected, although CODA, the CODA education requirements do not require that. Um, having a degree required, having practice restricted to particular settings or populations, um, and whether they have an education program in there. So you can just, there's a lot of variability um, in the way that this is playing out. This is the same information, just in a much prettier diagram. Uh, this is on our Oral Health Workforce Research Center um, website, and it is interactive. So if you wanted to know more about any of the states, you can go to the website um, that's listed there and click through and uh, really learn a lot more about that. So the future of team-based care, again, with the, the um, idea of dental therapists was not to uh, replace any other providers, but to create a, uh, a new provider with a different pathway and a different um, ability to interact with the, um, the team and to be responsive to communities' um, needs. And there's a lot of things that are um, being sort of the redesign of dental, moving to larger practices, different payment models, um, more accountability uh, for public payment, uh, using evidence-based care, uh, looking at models for dental medical integration um, and expansions of coverage and access, all of those things that are affecting all of our healthcare right now are also affecting dentistry um, in one way or the other. And the dental therapists sort of fit into um, one of the components of this redesign. So that is the end of my presentation. And I think we're going to wait to the end to take questions, but you can put things in the, um, the Q&A in the interim if you have um, 
Questions? Yes, thank you very much, Beth. We'll now turn it over to Simona for her part of the presentation. Okay, thank you so very much, uh, David, and everyone for <laughs> for your patience. So I, I'm just going to present you now a few um, uh, research um, results from our work on contribution to uh, of dental therapies to improve efficiency and capacity in the dental centers of Apple Tree Dental in Minnesota. David, please next. First, I would like to acknowledge uh, the support we received from Health Resources and Services Administration, as well as the contributions of Apple Tree Dental staff and my co-authors, Margaret Langerie and Jean Moore, to this research. The content and conclusion of these presentations are those of Oral Health Workforce Research Center and do not necessarily represent positions or policies of HRSA, SUNY, or Upper Tree Dental. Next, please. So there is growing uh, interest in understanding how introduction of dental therapy workforce has impacted the service mix, quantity and quality of care, as well as the capacity of the delivery system. And just a few words about Apple Tree Dental. Apple Tree Dental in Minnesota is a large nonprofit community dental provider that was among the first employers of dental therapists in early 2012. I'm going to refer sometimes to DTs, so dental therapists are, are also known as DTs. Patients at Apple Tree Dental consist of all age groups, many of whom have special healthcare needs, and the vast majority of their patients are low income and Medicaid beneficiaries. So our study examined patient encounter data in order to describe and compare the types and quantity of services provided by dentists before and after introduction of dental therapy workforce at Apple Tree Dental. Next, please. So for this study, we used 10 years of patient encounter data from 2009 to 2019. And this data included more than a quarter of a million visits by more than 76,000 patients uh, who received care at one of the dental centers operated by Apple Tree Dental in Minnesota. Uh, the results presented here are derived from two dental centers um, that have more than that have three years of encounter data before the introduction of dental therapy and more than seven years of experience with uh, a dental therapist in their clinics. Next, please. Okay, and this slide uh, summarizes the outcomes we measured in our study. So the first outcome we measured was the types of dental services uh, performed by dentists before and after introduction of dental therapy workforce at Apple Tree Dental. The second outcome was the changes in intensity and distribution of services provided by dentists. And these were described in terms of relative value units. For those of you who are not familiar with this terminology, the relative values units are actually a sum of uh, different attributes uh, that are related to a dental procedure, such as professional, professional training required to perform that procedure, complexity of the skills necessary, as well as the cost and re of resources involved, among other factors. A third outcome we measured in our survey was the economic impact of dental therapy on organizational revenue using the dental fees adjusted to 2018 fee levels. Next, please. So the next few slides are presenting our key uh, research findings. If you would like to learn more about our, our study uh, methods and findings, um, please um, uh, go to our website or our health work for research .org, where uh, we published a technical report. Um, during the 10 year study period, Apple Tree Dental employed 15 dental therapists and more than 30 dentists and uh, more than 30 dental hygienists. Next, please. This chart shows that 
trends in procedures by a dentist per treatment day during the 10 year study period. So I will try to orient you a little bit um, on this on this chart. Fortunately, I don't have the mouse to kind of point you, but the the pink uh, line on top uh, represents the average number of procedures per treatment day and the blue columns represent the the proportion of restorative services provided per treatment day by a dentist. Uh, so the results indicated a statistically significant trend in the average number of procedures provided by a dentist per treatment day after introduction of dental therapists. So if you look at the, at, at the pink line, you will see 18.7, uh, so almost 19 uh, almost 19 um, procedures per day in 2012 increased to nearly 26 dental procedures per treatment day in 2019. A similar increasing and significant trend was observed for the proportion of restorative services provided by a dentist during the study period. The next, please. Next slide. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, this slide uh, shows the results in terms of trends in patient visits seen by a dentist per treatment day during the 10 year study period. Again, the line on top of the graph represents the average number of patient visits seen by a dentist in a treatment day, while the bars are showing the proportion of patients. So the first bar is the proportion of elderly patients. The second bar is the proportion of children patients. And the last bar is the proportion of Medicaid insured patients seen by a dentist. So the, our results indicated again, an increasing trend in the number of patients seen by a dentist per day from nearly 10 patients per day in 2012 to almost 14 patients per day in 2019. In addition, we observed an increasing trend in terms of proportion of children patients and Medicaid beneficiaries seen by a dentist per treatment day in the um, study period. So roughly we uh, observed an increase by 10 percentage points between 2012 and 2019. Next slide, please. This chart shows the trends in relative value units produced by dentists per treatment day during the 10 year study period. Again, the line on top of the chart shows the average numbers of relative value units or RVUs per treatment day. And the bars are showing the proportion of RVUs generated from the restorative services provided by dentists. Our study results indicated an increasing trend in the relative value units produced by dentists per treatment day from nearly 49 RVUs in 2012 to 60 RVUs in 2019. Again, the restorative services generated the highest proportion of RVUs, particularly in the last three years of the study. The next slide, please. This is the last chart that I'm going to present to you today. And this is showing the trends in schedule fees by dentists per treatment day during the 10 year study period. The top line represents the average dental fees per treatment day produced by a dentist. And the bars or columns represent the proportion of fees generated through restorative um, procedures performed by a dentist. So once again, our study demonstrated an increasing trend in the dental fees 
produced by dentists per treatment day after, uh, after introduction of the ETs at Apple Tree Dental from around uh, 3,400 US dollars per day in 2012 to more than 4,000 per day in 2019. And once again, there was a positive trend in the proportion of fees generated from restorative services provided by dentists, particularly in the last three years, where we found that almost half of the fees were generated through restorative procedures performed by dentists. The next slide, please. So in conclusion, our study, study findings indicated that both the number and complexity of services provided by dentists increased um, in the years after introduction of DTs to dental teams, particularly after dental therapists were fully integrated at Apple Tree Dental. In addition, the total number of patients as well as the Medicaid beneficiaries seen by a dentist increased with introduction of dental therapy, reflecting organizational expansion at Apple Tree Dental. So our study suggests that introduction of dental therapists to clinical teams enhanced the capacity and productivity, enabling Apple Tree Dental to provide um, and increase uh, more services needed by the patient population. So that would be the all from me today. I think the next slide is just uh, if you'd like David to go to the next. Yeah, the, thank you. One. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simona. And, and last but not least, Margie Langmuir. All right, take it away, Margie. Okay. So um, let me go back up. I'm, so today I'm here to talk to you about next steps in, uh, in dental therapy. Um, but first, I'd like to, to um, sort of follow up on what Simona is, uh, has presented, because we did a second study um, at Apple Tree Dental assessing provider and patient satisfaction with the workforce model. Um, I encourage you, because my presentation will be brief, to look at this report, which is just hot off the presses and not yet on our website, but it should be there within the next week or two. Um, and then the second part of my presentation will be just a discussion about the problems with advancing and implementing the dental therapy workforce model. So um, I, the, let me tell you about the survey of patients and providers at Apple Tree Dental to assess satisfaction with the dental therapy model. These surveys were web-based. They were conducted in 2021. We solicited all clinical providers at any Apple Tree Dental site at one of the um, seven um, uh, dental centers or um, anyone who worked in their 149 um, mobile programs. Uh, we uh, also asked certain clinical staff to complete the survey, but we excluded people like custodial staff and executive staff from the survey. Uh, we used a quota sample, a convenient sample of patients, and we used uh, validated items from published literature um, in our um, assessments of patient satisfaction. We used four different surveys for staff, one for dentists, one for dental hygienists and dental assistants, one for dental therapists and advanced dental therapists, and another for administrators. All had common questions, but each had at least one question specific to the profession. Um, in the patient survey, we surveyed all adult patients and we surveyed parents or guardians of dependent children or adults about their satisfaction with the provider of recent services at Apple Tree Dental. We sought proportional representation of patients to clinical providers, by which I mean that, for instance, two fifths of the clinical providers at Apple Tree Dental are dentists. We hoped that our uh, 1,000 patient respondents would include two fifths um, of dentist patients, two fifths of dental hygienist patients, and one fifth of dental therapist or advanced dental therapist patients. So what did we find? Next slide, please, David. Providers really do recognize the benefits of dental therapy. 
Uh, we found that um, both clinical providers and um, administrators were satisfied with the addition of dental therapists to the clinical teams. When asked about how well dental therapists fit within the team structures at Apple Tree Dental, all providers indicated excellent fit. In addition, they agreed that the work of dental therapists was high quality and that their presence allowed dentists to work more efficiently and effectively. Nine of the 11 dental therapists within the organization responded to the survey and as expected, expressed very high levels of satisfaction with their jobs and their professional autonomy. Um, and then uh, again, I would encourage you to look at the report. Much of the, um, the data is, uh, was assessed using Likert scales. So you can um, you know, see in more detail the results from that particular survey. So we, um, in that report, we also included the results from the patient satisfaction survey. And um, we compared patient satisfaction across all pro provider types. Patients with emails on file at Apple Tree received the survey within a week of an encounter. Uh, we found small differences in satisfaction ratings by provider type in the different domains of satisfaction that we were measuring. Those domains included information and communication, understanding and acceptance, and technical competence and satisfaction with treatment. However, the differences were generally not significant and no provider type emerged as more satisfying overall. Our interpretation of the findings is that dental therapists are now integrated within the dental teams at Apple Tree Dental and patients are very satisfied with their care. Um, we also asked a question about overall sa satisfaction and found that on average, patients agreed or strongly agreed that they would return to Apple Tree Dental for future services. I think this work is particularly important because the literature suggests that patient satisfaction is a very, very important component of quality of care and these findings would support that uh, quality um, of patient care has not been compromised by the introdu introduction of dental therapy to practice. So this asks a question um, or, or makes a statement. It's just not about legislation. Um, instituting a new, new workforce model, as you've heard today, is a pretty complex undertaking. And I'm using the word new uh, very loosely because it is important to remember, as, as Beth commented, um, that the skill sets incorporated in this hybrid workforce model already exist in dental hygiene and dentistry. So we have tools already to train the workforce. And in addition, dental therapists in, in some form have been practicing for over a century in New Zealand and for decades in more than 50 countries in the world. Um, this particular slide uses a red light, green light metaphor to show which of the necessarily necessary elements in full adoption and integration of a workforce model is moving forward. The areas where there is um, action occurring, but cautiously occurring. And uh, the red where the major barrier is um, preventing timely progress. And as you can see, that's in mainly in the establishment of high quality educational pathways to the profession. And if we legislate it, will they build it? Currently, we have found foundational guidance on the workforce in the form of training and accreditation standards and in the existing literature, um, attesting to safety and efficacy, some of which you've heard today. Uh, we have a common goal, which is to increase access to oral health services, but there are so many differing views on how it can be achieved. For example, organized dental groups often suggest that we don't need new workforce, that a better strategy to improve availability of services would be to increase Medicaid reimbursement rates in every state and provide a healthy adult dental benefit in the program. This movement um, is still encountering a significant amount of professional resistance, um, a certain amount of legislative hes hesitancy, all the while um, advocates are confronting increasing urgency of need. So is dental therapy the result of a natural evolution, a troublesome disruption, or a necessary innovation? Um, I think the answer it can be either one or all of these, depending on your attitude or your um, perspective on the new workforce model. This is really an important question because um, stakeholders will tell you that attitudes about the model can ease, slow, or inhibit adoption and implementation. 
Um, you know, we're always asking the question, can the problem be solved by other means? Um, patient advocacy groups and safety net providers believe that the increased capacity uh, occasioned by having dental therapists will shorten wait times to services and also reduce the cost of delivering services. Legislators remain cautious about the impacts on public safety, the expense of innovation, and, and they are very concerned about preventing disruptions to the oral health service delivery system. Certain structural barriers impede innovation. One of the major ones is education programs. There's a lot of nuance in um, educating a, a dental therapist uh, based on degree requirements, clinical operatory capacity, et cetera. So that has been a major barrier for the general movement in the United States. Um, attitude toward the new workforce model can not only prevent legislation from passing, but it can also slow adoption, <coughs> excuse me, even in places where it's legislatively enabled. Um, in some states, the legislation remains in committee for long periods of time. Uh, in others, regulatory bodies have been very slow in issuing regulations to describe practice parameters. Some of this is caused by necessary caution, but there is a danger that it's also tinged by a bit of reluctance. We need to remember that right now, oral health is experiencing a significant period of transform transformation. We have new dental materials, things like glass ionomer sealants, silver diamine fluoride, we have improved technologies, lasers, Invisalign, 3D printing. Dental services are now being delivered in innovative ways through mobile and portable dentistry and teledentistry. Pat practices are consolidating management functions. And there's a discussion about the advent of value-based care in dentistry. Despite innovation, we still take rigid approaches to uh, planning for our clinical workforce that delivers these services. This, the innovation culture in oral health generally has not yet um, improved the planning processes for workforce. We continue to plan for workforce in professional silos rather than looking at how planning affects access and the dental team. So there's lots of movement forward for dental therapy, even though my previous slide sounded a little bit uh, negative. Uh, legislation has passed in 13 states and it's being or has been considered in 15 or 16 more. Um, still to date, um, dental therapists only practice statewide in Minnesota. They're providing services in tribal communities in Alaska, Oregon, and Washington. And just last year, a dental therapist began working in Maine, despite the fact that the legislation passed in 2014. Some of the problems are the basic variation on who can qualify for practice, what level of education is needed, and what the profession should be called. For instance, um, the, um, it's a dental health aid therapist in Alaska, as, uh, as Beth uh, mentioned. Several of these um, legislative initiatives have begun with um, oral health practitioner models, advanced dental hygiene practice models. It does seem that the title is morphing to dental therapist. Uh, when Maine initially passed the legislation in 2014, they passed legislation for a dental hygiene therapist. The word hygiene was redacted from the statute in a, in a statutory revision in 2019. So now it is a dental therapist. There are varying education requirements. As Beth mentioned, CODA has developed a uh, a training um, a training program um, standards that uh, calls for three years of, of training. The CODA standards are degree agnostic. Still in Minnesota, uh, there is a bachelor slash master's degree required and there's some nuance there I can explain if anyone has a question. In Maine, it's a master's degree. In Connecticut, it's 18 months beyond a dental hygiene license, just to give you an example of the variation. There are only two functioning education programs in the United States in Minnesota, one at the University of Minnesota um, School of Dentistry and another at um, the uh, Metropolitan State University in a combined program with Normandale Community College. Uh, there's variation in clinical practice requirements. Um, it, it varies everything from 500 to 2000 hours. And in Nevada, there are three different clinical practice requirements depending on 
um, how you begin your license process. Uh, Native American initiatives have progressed. The Swinomish tribe in Washington just built a dental, dental clinic with four rooms for DT clinical education programs for those um, dental therapists to graduate from the tribal college in Alaska. And the Lumi tribe has set up licensure mechanisms independent of state licensing authority in Washington for the tribal dental therapists or the dental health aid therapists. Um, again, there's basic disagreement on the model, whether it should be an entry level model for anyone, um, regardless of experience working in oral health. The dental hygiene model is sort of emerging in states uh, more prominently than the entry level model. But again, that's, that remains to be seen. Uh, there are limits on practice settings and patients. The only state without limits on practice settings or patient type is Vermont. Maine, however, although it had original limits in its statute in 2014, removed those limits in 2019. So there is good news. Some constants are emerging. So the last question is, as we move forward, can we learn from history or are we just repeating it? I, I think many of you on this seminar have watched the evolution of the NP and PA models over the last 50 years. Um, I remember very well the variation in education requirements that um, programs struggled with and, it, and the, the struggle occurred during the time of educational creep in allied health generally. But um, years ago, a physician assistant could practice with an associate degree or a certificate and that's now advanced to a master's degree level. And we've gone through all kinds of discussions about minutia within scope of practice. I, I still remember in several states during some studies that we were doing that they were arguing over whether a nurse midwife who attended a birth could actually sign the birth certificate or whether a nurse practitioner who was sitting with a hospice, hospice patient at death could sign the death certificate. So um, fortunately, these workforce models have now relatively uh, are now relatively consistent across states. Uh, we're forming licensure compacts and enable portability and locum tenants. So, um, and as you know, that was especially important during the recent public health emergency. So I'm hoping that those of us who are stakeholders and advocates for moving dental therapy for, forward can encourage some basic consensus so that we avoid the expense and the 50 years that it took to rationalize or standardize the model in states. So quickly in conclusion, um, dental therapy is an innovation in the US health, healthcare system that is showing promising impacts on oral health access for many. Um, obviously we need to arrive at some consensus on minimum standards for the model. Uh, there is you know, certainly um, support in the literature of the efficacy and the importance of the model internationally and now in the United States. There is a model legislation um, this was developed by the National Dental Therapy Standards Consortium. I've included the, the link to that. And uh, as mentioned, CODA has developed recommended training standards and accreditation standards. In, in addition, a professional association now exists for the American Dental Therapy Association. So I will close there and move to um, David and any questions. Thank you very much, Margie. Um, thanks to all three of you for your very informative presentations. Um, we've now arrived at the time for our question and answer uh, session. Uh, and uh, Dr. Frank Calinato, um, uh, who's really been one of the champions of dental therapy uh, in, uh, organized, in dentistry, you know, is joined us and, and asked a few, I think, really important essential questions. And one of the questions that he asked in the chat had to do with um, the statement that there are varying opinions about quality and safety of dental therapy services. And, and he asked, is there any evidence that actually supports concerns about quality and safety? Um, Dr. Mertz answered that in the chat, um, in the question and answer, and, and said, uh, no data to indicate quality issues and um, put a link in the chat to a paper that she uh, Margie Simona and, and other folks at the Rural Health Workforce Centers published in Medical Care last fall. Beth, I don't know if there's anything more you want to say about that. You know, Janet, I, I can say that there's been no malpractice um, suits against the in Minnesota for the dental therapists. I think there were one or two complaints in the 10 years and they were all dismissed. So 
um, I think that um, that that in a sense is some measure of um, of, of quality of care or um, our safe patient safety. Okay, thanks. And and Dr. Catalanato also asked whether any of the speakers know of studies that have evaluated the quality, safety, or cost effectiveness of the community dental health coordinators that Beth, I think you mentioned briefly early on. Yeah, there hasn't been a systematic evaluation of that. Um, and that's partially because of the way that got rolled out, um, it really ended up being sort of a bunch of different models depending on the individuals that took it up at the beginning. Um, they, had in, they had started out with the idea that they would train community health workers to have a little bit more dental knowledge and be able to add that into their general scope. Um, and what ended up happening, my understanding is what ended up happening is a lot of dental hygienists decided they wanted to be these community dental health coordinators. And so they actually had to sort of change it and decide and actually train the dental hygienists to be community health workers versus community health workers to have the dental knowledge. Um, but it has been relatively, they have them in a number of states now, 15 or 25, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and I've seen one study evaluating them, and I believe it was in Indiana, um, uh, sort of talking from an individual dental practice, how this person was able to refer more people in and get them to keep their appointments. Um, so this wouldn't be any different than you know, what, we, what we've seen from evaluations of community health workers generally. Um, I don't know, Mark, if you have other information. Yeah, you know, I we have also worked with um, studying community health workers, and I think that the community dental health coordinator suffered from the same issue that many community health worker programs suffered from, which was because they're not providing clinical services, there is no direct reimbursement for the services. So community health worker programs are often funded in grant funded program, are often employed in grant funded programs or in FQHCs, um, safety net provider organizations. Uh, there was an attempt in Ohio several years ago to get some legislation to allow uh, community health workers, for instance, to do some very basic um, clinical work and it was defeated. So I think what happened with the community dental health coordinator is that they realized that there was a realization that by adding on very excellent motivational interviewing skills that are endemic in that model, to a dental assisting or a dental hygiene model, it still allowed the professional to provide a billable clinical service while working with the patient so that there was some economic um, support for the model. Um, I, yeah, the, I do know that the federal government is looking very heavily at community health workers and we've certainly encouraged them to include uh, community dental health coordinators in that, that look and in their work uh, because we do feel that that model is 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 very important, uh, especially in certain communities um, that are underserved. Thank you very much, Margie and Beth. Um, did, uh, one other question about Minnesota, which is whether you have any plans to study the impact of dental therapists on dental services for children in Minnesota and go beyond the uh, study of Apple. Well, I, I would just say that we were very fortunate with Apple Tree Dental because we had such a vast amount of very specific information about services and patients and providers. It's very difficult to study a population when um, data is so limited. I mean, we are of course interested in improving the, you know, the, the efficacy of dental therapists, but again, it's a matter of having data available to actually um, do a, a study that has some, some quality and integrity. So, uh, you know, there, there were certainly children involved in the Apple Tree Dental um, um, setting so that they were, you know, obviously it was examined in our study, uh, but again, that's a, it's one setting, it's one limited setting, it's not statewide or, um, uh, but again, it's a matter of uh, data limitations. Thanks, Marie. I think, uh, you know, all of us in health services research, particularly health workforce research, struggle with data availability. Um, we have a new question, which is any experience with Medicaid pass-through support payments for dental therapy services? Hmm. I don't know that there's been any, you know, um, in Minnesota, for instance, I know that obviously there's 
Um, FQHCs receive prospective payment systems. Minnesota also has a, as a, um, a Medicaid enhanced rate for safety net providers that provide services to over a certain percentage of patients. And Apple Tree Dental, 80% of their patients are Medicaid eligible. So there is a bit of an enhanced re reimbursement rate. And I don't remember whether it's 10%. I really don't know what the exact rate is. I don't know of any pass throughs. Um, Unfortunately, Minnesota is the only place that we can talk about uh, because really it's the only place where the, the Medicaid system is really, certainly in the Indian Health Service, but that's a very, very different complex. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how much of that would apply to, to um, state statewide practice, so. Well, the, I mean, they're billable providers for Medicaid. Yeah. Um, and in, in Alaska, they do bill to Medicaid. The um, uh, study, there's two studies that Donald Chi did um, of the implementation of DHATS up in Alaska, and one of them was using Medicaid claims data to look at the change in service provision and so forth. So um, they, they do have the exec, someone just said they, they can bill Medicaid directly with their own MPI um, as long as it's in scope. So um, they're at, at least in the places where they're currently um, working. Well, and I, and I think that in Minnesota as well, and I see Mark Schoenbaum's on here, is there's a payment parity too, whether the service is provided by a dentist or a dental therapist, the payment rate is the same. So, and, and, and Mark is commenting, yes, dental therapists have their own NPI and they can bill directly for services um, in Minnesota. And yes, thank you, Mark. I think one of there, you know, as much as we all miss in-person meetings, one of the beauties of this format is the bet, the ability to, to sort of crowdsource expertise on the topic. We um, are almost at time. Does anyone else have a question? Please put in the chat for Q and A. If not, um, I would very much like to thank our, our three panelists and also thank uh, David Armstrong and his colleague Matt at the Health Workforce Technical Assistance uh, Center um, for working with us not only as a thought partner, but also providing uh, the platform for our webinar and, and some behind the scenes tech stuff uh, for us. Uh, we do, I guess I should mention, David, we do have an evaluation form that you'll be sending out. You want to say a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, the, the actual form will pop up right when you exit the uh, Zoom webinar. It's built into Zoom. So. Okay, so, so please, um, please do fill that out. We really want to get your feedback. And yeah, we, we really do appreciate it. It informs us on where we should go next with our presenters, et cetera. So. Mm -hmm. Right, and we want to, at the interest group, continue to do more collaboration with um, David Center. So if you have ideas for webinar, by all means, let us know. And if they align, well, we'll, we'll, we'll join up again. So Definitely. thanks very much to everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And thanks, Beth, for filling in at the last minute. That was very much no, Yes, yes. <laughs> and yes. just a reminder. Yeah. The slides will be available on our website oh, yes, David. very shortly, and a recording of this event will be available in about a week. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a great week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you for watching the webinar. To view our extensive webinar library and other helpful resources, please visit us at healthworkforcetta.org.